All right, welcome back everybody. Now it is time for me to review Shogun episode five, Broken to the Fist. So this episode opens with a scene of the villagers cleaning up after the disaster that took place in the previous episode. They are left to clean up the carnage of what Nagakato's immature actions led to. You see the gardener Wajiro speaking to Moraji and he's basically telling him, you know, what did we do to deserve this? We didn't ask for this. There seems to be a dark cloud over them right now, a lot of bad omens. And this opening scene sets the tone for that. Suddenly, the villagers hear a large army approaching. They hear a lot of men riding in on horseback. They're a little terrified at first until they see the banners and they realize it's Tornaga. Nagakato is happy to see his father's return and he notices Buntaro. Buntaro's back and the look on Mariko's face is... Is she not happy? And then we see a council meeting between the remaining regents. They are going back and forth about who they should choose to replace Toranaga. Shugiyama suggests Ikita, which is a friend of Ishido's. But to that, Kiyama scoffs and says that this place will reek of countryside and refers to that man as an idiot. Then he suggests someone who I am assuming is a Christian because to his suggestion, Ishido says, well, then the seat will reek of Christian. <laughs> After his little insult, it seems that Kiyama leaves the meeting and his men apologize for his absence. Then Ishido recommends someone named Maida, but then Shugiyama objects, stating he will not share a seat with that rotting syphilis. Ishido then points out that Maida is Ono's cousin. Then we see Ono's men carry him out. And so you're left with just Shugiyama and Ishido to do absolutely nothing because there's only two of them. Then we see a scene between Toranaga and Mariko where Toranaga is discussing with her how her husband survived. It seems he got some assistance from some ronin. By the end of it, there were only two men left. Mariko just remarks on, yeah, I, he's super brave. Good for him. He made it. Then Mariko hands Toranaga the diary that she'd been keeping, where she was tracking everything that Blackthorn was doing and saying in Toranaga's absence. Toranaga then informs Mariko that she will continue to board with Blackthorn and that her husband will be joining them. <laughs> so fun. Finally, Toranaga asks Mariko if she believes the attack on Josen was his son's idea. To that, Mariko says she doesn't know. It's obvious Toranaga does not think that his son came up with this idea on his own. Through this scene, his son is there the whole time, by the way, okay? His son is there trying to get his attention, showing him his pheasant, that the falcon, it wasn't a hawk. In the first couple of episodes, I referred to that bird as a hawk. It's a falcon. Uh, but he's hunting, the, he's using the falcon to hunt. He finds a pheasant and he keeps trying to get his dad's attention. But the whole time, Toranaga is playing this boy death. Mariko leaves and Toranaga is clearly irritated with Nagakato. And he asks him if he ever considered that he was playing right into Yabushige's trap and that he could possibly be doing another man's bidding, which is the real issue here for Toranaga with his son. He doesn't actually take issue with what transpired. He takes issue with the fact that his son didn't have an original thought and that his son is easily manipulated by other men and that his son can be used as a weapon by other men. He don't like that. In the next scene, we see Ishido back at Osaka Castle and his men bring him Josen's head. Poor Josen. They shouldn't have had their asses up in there in the first place. Back at Blackthorn's house, he has been given that pheasant as a gift from Toranaga. He's 
stoked about it for some reason. But instead of giving the pheasant to the servants of the house who know how to prepare the food, okay, he decides he's going to hang the bird outside of the house. And he says he's going to let it mature. Fuji immediately tries to call him out on this and is like, um, isn't it just going to rot, <laughs> baby? <laughs> but again, language barrier. Mariko's not there to translate. They don't understand what the other is saying. And Blackthorn proceeds to just hang that bird outside. Fuji, you know, is able to motion to him like, you know, this is, this is going to stink. Do you understand rot? Do you understand rot, white man? Do you understand that? And he replies, yes, there will be a terrible stench. But he's stoked. He's so happy about it. He's like, look, this is a gift from Toronaga, So it has to be the best bird ever prepared. Now for this man to insinuate that this rotten, fly-infested bird is about to be the most delicious bird in all the Japans. And look, I thought maybe that was a thing, but it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't a thing. Europeans definitely know how to preserve their food. I, I couldn't find nothing where they weren't either burying it in some kind of salt to cure it or putting it in some kind of solution to ferment it. I don't know what this man, I don't know where he got this idea from, but this isn't what they were doing. This isn't what they were doing where he's from, okay? Whatever he was taught, he missed a couple of steps because they wasn't doing this. Then Blackthorn proceeds to tell them in a the little bit of Japanese that he knows, what does he say exactly? I think he says, don't touch or die. He says something along those lines, like touch it, you die. <laughs> then we get to see a scene between Bantaro and Fuji back at Blackthorn's place. Bantaro is talking to her about what it's like being consort for Blackthorn and ask if he makes her pillow. Inappropriate to be asking your niece, but whatever. And she lets him know, no, he doesn't. And he's like, well, that's good because barbarians should lay with other barbarians. And to that, she says, well, he prefers the company of other women. <laughs> then we see Toranaga confront Yabushinge about his orders to return to Osaka Castle and repledge his loyalty to the council. Yabushige does what he can to reassure Toranaga of his loyalty to him and says that he's not going to return. He doesn't care about the consequences, even though he totally does. But Toranaga then tries to get Yabushinge to admit that he's the one who planted this idea in Nagakato's head. Yabushige, the, the boy just don't know how to play the game. He really doesn't, but whatever. Yabushige being him decides, I'm going to throw my nephew under the bus. Hey, Omi was having sake with Nagakato the night before. I think it was my nephew who planted this idea in his head. And then he proceeds to say, I will go ahead and discipline him. So that Toranaga is like, disciplining? <laughs> He's brilliant. Like I've been saying, Toranaga sees it, I see it. Okay? He's not upset about what happened, okay? He's upset about how it happened. He's disappointed in his son. He's disappointed that this wasn't an original thought from his son. He's disappointed that another man was able to manipulate him into doing his bidding. And so he's impressed that Omi was able to manipulate Nagakato the way that he did. And with that new information, he decides he wants to put Omi in charge of leading this new regiment, which of course Yabushinke is not too happy about, but oh well. Then we see Yabushige tearing up some poor villager's house looking to see if they are a spy. During this time, he decides to inform Omi that he's now to command this new regiment. Omi, trying to show his loyalty to his uncle, tells him, you know, if, if you wish it, I would like to relinquish command 
to you. To that, Yabushige gets super offensive and is like, come again, little boy? How are you gonna relinquish control when I already control it? What you doing? What are you, where are you, what are you, where are you, where are you saying? What are you trying to imply here? Omi backs down, he gets down on his knees, apologizes for offending him, and that's that. Then we see a scene between Mariko and Fuji back at Blackthorn's home. They are talking about how Blackthorn has totally contaminated this kitchen. Again, this looming black cloud. It, it kind of seems like Fuji might be a little sick. I don't know, I'm not sure. Like it seemed like she sounded a little congested when she was talking. I know in another scene they were talking about keeping their utensils separate from Blackthorns. They think that he has brought a spirit into the house. <laughs> That is just fucking everything up. So they're discussing that and the fact that Bantaro has returned. Fuji asks Mariko if she would let her know if she thought Blackthorn was in trouble. To that, Mariko responds like, girl, why would he be in trouble? I'm trying to play coy, like Fuji don't know you. Then we see Buntaro arrive being all Buntaro. This is actually another scene where I kind of feel bad for him. The man is being attacked by flies from that rotten bird. Okay, they just smacking that man all up in the face. Then his poor niece comes outside to let everyone know that dinner is ready. And just the look on her face, you can tell. She don't want to serve nobody that food. Blackthorn then presents to them his English rabbit stew. They're, <laughs> he's trying to share his culture with them. They're not into it. They reject it while simultaneously trying not to gag. He says, you know, hey, it's, it's not the same without Sherry anyway. And so he lets it go and they proceed to eat the food that they've been eating every day. But then Bantaro gotta start with his shit and he starts talking about the way Blackthorn is slurping his noodles. Then the two of them proceed to get into the dumbest dick measuring contest over who can slurp their noodles the loudest and who can drink sake out of the biggest bowl. <laughs> After some time has passed, you see Fuji instructing the house staff, look, if Blackthorn asks for more sake, we don't have it, okay? We out. And go throw that stew in the ocean. So now we are in a pretty tense scene with Blackthorn and Buntaro going back and forth. Blackthorn is anxious to have Mariko translate everything that Buntaro is saying. Mariko is being very careful not to translate exactly what these men are saying to one another because they are going to get into a fight if she were to translate word for word, bar for bar. Blackthorn wants to hear about how Buntaro escaped. But Buntaro explains that heroism is for the dead and stories are for children. He does not want to talk about it, clearly. I mean, he was traumatized. He was traumatized. Who wants to talk about that? It's fresh, bro. Give me a second. But Blackthorn doesn't understand that, you know, where he's from, Blackthorn, it's totally normal for people to boast about their wins and brag like nobody is offended by it they see it as entertaining but in their culture it is seen as arrogant and impolite and so his ignorance to their cultural differences leads to him insulting Buntaro uh, which for some reason uh, makes Buntaro want to use his wife's head as target practice, apparently, to show off what a good samurai he is. Even after drinking several bowls of sake, he wants to show him, look how good I am with my arrows. Mariko is clammed up, chow, because what the hell else can she do? Fuji is trying to get her uncle to stop, but, you know, she knows her place. <laughs> She knows her place. Blackthorn is in shock and tells Buntaro he should treat his wife with more courtesy. After saying, I mean, I know she your property. <laughs> I know she your property, okay? We all out here treating our wives like property, but you should treat her with more courtesy. That doesn't make any sense. Those two things don't go together. I'm sorry, you can't see someone as your property. <laughs> 
and then also be like, hmm, I'm going to treat you with respect. By virtue of you seeing me as property, you do not respect me. What's not, what's not clicking? So Bantaro doubles down and he starts laughing like, what? Respect this hoe? Never. And he instructs Mariko to tell him, to tell Blackthorn why he don't respect her, why she don't deserve respect and why she's a filthy, filthy little woman. So then Mariko tells the story of her father's betrayal and how as a consequence he had to slaughter their entire family, her mother, her siblings. And then he had to commit seppuku. Since Mariko had recently been married, she was prohibited from participating. Once a year, on the anniversary of all of their deaths, she requests to be allowed to commit seppuku, but her husband denies her the privilege. So that's what Mariko's going through. She desperately wants to die, and her husband is standing in her way. It's this honor system for me, cause like, I mean, you don't need permission to die. You know what I'm saying? If you wanna go out, you could just go out, but whatever, this honor thing, I guess. It's not honorable to self delete without permission, I guess. After she tells her little story, she's visibly upset and excuses herself. Then we see Blackthorn fast asleep, but he is awakened by the sound of Bantaro beating up Mariko. He rushes to go and help her, but Fuji jumps in front of him to letting him know, look, my uncle has already left, but he pushes past her and goes into Mariko's room. Mariko is upset that he is in there seeing her this way. Fuji tries to explain, I tried to stop him, but he doesn't listen. And then Mariko just loses it a bit and screams at them and asks them to leave. Fuji snaps back at her and is like, hey, you disrupt this home. You dishonor Blackthorn. You bring shame to this house. And Mariko's like, girl, this house already cursed. What I'm shaming? It's already there. We already in hell, girl. Blackthorn decides to follow Bantaro outside of the house and he's shouting at him. Uh, again, I don't know what he thinks this is going to accomplish. Y'all don't understand each other. You don't speak the same language. All he knows is that you're angry and you're shouting. Okay? You're disrupting the neighborhood. Got neighbors going and shutting their doors because you out here being loud. Shouting at a drunk man. Okay, Bantaro drops down on his knees and puts his swords down and apologizes for disrupting Blackthorn's home and blames it on the fact that, you know, we was getting lit. All this sake and these big ass bowls, you know what I mean? That's why we drink out of these little cups. Huh? It's not beer, it's sake. A completely different level of alcoholic beverage. Next, we see Muranji meeting with Toronaga about him being his spy. We find out that Muranji is actually a samurai. They talk about how Yabushige is tearing up the village looking for his spy. Muranji asks Toronaga if he can turn himself in. He would like to just be done with this. Let me turn myself in before somebody else gets hurt. I let me just turn myself in before anybody else gets hurt. But Toronaga don't give a damn about none of that. Toronaga don't give a damn about nothing. He never do. And he just suggests to Moranji to find somebody to pin it on. Okay? You gonna find somebody to frame. That's what you gonna do. In the next scene, we see Blackthorn staff who are growing increasingly worried about that damn bird and all them flies. Okay? They are also remarking on the arrows. Okay? Why we got arrows and a diseased bird. They believe that there is a Tatari Gami in the house. A Tatari Gami is essentially a vengeful spirit. They can be created for many different reasons. There's a story about a god who was slain and that created a Tatari Gami. They can be created from a noble 
dying in a tragic way and they bring massive conflict, they bring famine, they bring disease. And so that's what everyone in the village thinks that they're dealing with. They think that there is a vengeful spirit living in Blackthorn's home and they gotta do something about it. Fuji asks Blackthorn if they can just get rid of the bird, but again, no one is there to translate between the two. He has no idea what she's asking of him and he is distracted anyway because he wants to find Mariko. He can't find her. And so he just rushes off to go find her, ignoring the plight of these poor people who just want to get rid of this bird. Blackthorn finally finds Mariko and they just have a back and forth again about their cultural differences. Blackthorn cannot seem to understand why Mariko has the convictions that she has and why she is so loyal to the cause and why she doesn't just be rid of her husband. As if, again, I hate when he talks to her like this, as if it is not the exact same way in his country. What are you talking about? Like whoever wrote this, they're really trying to act like it's like modern day compared to feudal Japan. A wife could not just get up and leave her husband. She was his property. What are you talking about? Women didn't have rights. Like, why are you talking to her like that? So annoying. Hey, but you get the idea from this scene that he really just looks down on their customs and their beliefs and their traditions. He thinks it's silliness and he just does not understand why she doesn't just be done with it. Which again is very stupid because you can't be done with yours, baby. Blackthorn goes back to his house and while he's on his way there, he notices villagers crying and being sad. And then he finds out that Wajiro, the gardener, has been put to death. And he was put to death for getting rid of that bird. The poor man just couldn't take it anymore. Blackthorn's reaction to this, he's just disappointed. And he's just so confused. He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand. I'm not sure if he knew what words he was using. Like I said, he he gave them the command in Japanese when he was just like, if you touch it, you die. I'm not sure if he knew what he was saying exactly, like if he meant to just say you'll be in trouble or whatever, but he's upset. He thinks they're all insane. It's like, you killed that man just for getting rid of some stupid bird, which is just was triggering me <laughs> it was triggering me so bad because he didn't even care about the fucking bird and he allowed his ignorance to get this man killed over something he didn't even give a damn about what were you keeping it out there for you saw how bothered everyone was even if you couldn't speak the language you saw everyone grasping their noses and going like this and being disgusted and everyone is miserable because of this fucking pheasant that now we find out you didn't even give a fuck about and now you're mad <laughs> Like we don't have history books, like we can't read. As if in his own country, thieves were not flogged, dismembered, okay? Or hung for stealing shit. Why is he, I just, again, I don't, the writing for me to try to make it seem like he comes from some like evolved utopia where everyone is treated equally and everyone has freedom is insane to me y'all kill thieves too in his sleep fuji fuji want to die anyway right because when blackthorn gets upset and screams at them and tells them oh go away go away fuji drops down and is like kill me now please you know because she sees that she's offended him but she's fucking confused because she's like bro we just did exactly what you wanted to but she drops down and asks him to kill her so she clearly don't care about dying so why you don't just take his ass out wait for you and then just get in there sis take one for the team fuji come on mariko y'all both want to die so bad y'all both want to die so bad Take these, take these men out, take them out. In the next scene, we see Blackthorn approach Tornaga and request that he be permitted to leave, take his men and go back to England, never to return to Japan. Tornaga is irritated by him, okay? And so am I. We're all exhausted by Blackthorn. 
Okay, because he really do be acting like a little boy sometimes. Toranaka is looking at Mariko. He's looking at Blackthorn. He was like, I noticed a black cloud over y'all. What's going on? What's up? What's the haps? Mariko explains to him what happened with the gardener. And Toranaga is like, definitely don't have time for this. <laughs> Grow the fuck up. Okay. And then Mariko basically just briefly explains to him, you know, Moranji, who they see as like a like a keeper of the village they his house went to him and asked you know what can we do about this pheasant and moranji is like hey this is a house issue you guys have to handle it wajiro sacrificed himself they said he was sick and ailing anyway and so he decided to take the bird bury it to help ease everyone in the village and so he sacrificed his life and she said it was a better death than he could have hoped for. Just then, an earthquake starts and it swallowed Toranaga's ass right on up. Swallowed up, have you ever been swallowed up? You see his people run after him, trying to help. They get down into where the earth split to find him. Blackthorn manages to dig him up out of the rubble. They look around for his swords, which have been lost. And so Blackthorn offers his swords. Tornaga is thankful. And then they look over to see the rest of the village just being destroyed by this earthquake. The earth looks like it's rippling like waves and it is just destroying that village. Blackthorn goes to his house. He wants to check on Fuji. His house seems okay. It, it seems pretty much intact. The, you can tell something happened. And then you see Fuji laying face down in front of the house. She's alive, but it appears that she has sustained some sort of injury to her back. And one of the other house ladies is helping to patch her up. Blackthorn and her share a little moment. You can tell he's very concerned for her. They've definitely built a friendship, like I said before. I, When they had the whole gun and sword gift swap, <laughs> uh, I see like a genuine friendship there. Then you see Blackthorn get up and go into the garden and move around the rocks the way you would see Wajiro do the same. And yeah, it, it seems like he's starting to get it a little bit more. But I just wish he was getting it faster, child. Then we see Yabushinge's ass outside of <laughs> Wajiro's house with Omi and Moranji. And they're saying, oh, this is the stuff that we discovered after the earthquake. And it is paraphernalia that shows that Wajiro was the spy. So Moranji found his guy to pin it on. Thank goodness it was somebody who was already dead. <laughs> and nobody had to die over this. So Lady Ochiba, she finally arrives home and to hear her talk, she is under the impression that she was being held at Toranaga's castle. And then I thought about the second episode, that first scene with Toranaga, or well, that first scene where we see Lady Eo and oh see and, and I had said when I recapped that episode I mistakenly said that Lady Eo was oh, what was Tornaga's wife's name I accidentally confused the two I confused those two women but that was Lady Eo um sitting with her husband um but anyway in that scene there are three times that Lady Ochiba and Toranaga share glances and they're not polite. Okay. There's some, there's some something there. She don't like that man. In that scene as well, the Taiko remarks to Toranaga and is like, remember there was a time when Lady Ochiba could have been your wife. And that's when he's like, mm, I never had a thing for beautiful women because she bad. <laughs> Lady Ochiba tends to keep a pretty cold demeanor. She doesn't express much with her face or her eyes. And that's why I love her, okay? I love me a cold calculating patty. They do something to me. So then we get to expand on what we saw in the trailer. And I said, I felt like ain't no way this woman was talking to that man that way unless she was getting ready to kill him or if she was getting ready to have him do her bidding. 
And turns out it's the latter. She looms over Ishido and she lets him know, look, the council is gonna be under my control. And that is how this episode ends. Oh, where my fruit show? All right. This one for sure was a nail biter. I had a feeling that Lantaro was not dead, but I didn't expect him to return so quickly. I'm kind of glad we can't explore this relationship between Mariko and Blackthorn any further because Lantaro's back. Thank God I was not here for the Mariko Blackthorn romance. Mm -mm. I do like that Blackthorn feels protective of Mariko though because her husband is dangerous bastard and you know hopefully while blackthorn is around he can protect her from him should we watch the next trailer the time has come for us to turn towards toranaga as an ally tuesday <laughs> FX's Shogun, all new Tuesdays. Was it Kiku where she said women shouldn't just stand by while other women are suffering? I love that. I love that. It gives secret female cult looking to overthrow the patriarchy. I'm here for it. <laughs> that's not what they're gonna give me. Well, I know that's not the show I'm about to get, but I would love to see it. These poor women. I feel so bad for these women. <laughs> Matter of fact, <laughs> if I find out that Ishido is riding for Lady Ochiba, I'm gonna be Team Ishido. Fuck to another. Yeah. Especially the way. When he found out Buntaro was whooping on Mariko, and he was like, I don't give a damn. I said, man's right. He can do whatever he want to do to his wife. Off with his head. Off with it. Fuck Toronaga. If Ishido is writing for Lady Ochiba, then I'm writing for uh, Ishido. And that's that on that. Feel free to leave your opinions in the comments below. Let me know what your predictions are for episode six, Ladies of the Willow World. And what y'all think? Y'all jump into Team Ishido with me? Yes, no? Fight me in the comments. See you guys in the next one. Bye. <laughs>